Hey, so in section 2.3, we're going to still be looking at limits. And actually for chapter 2, we're going to be looking at limits the whole time. Um, in chapter 2.3 or section 2.3, you're going to feel a little overwhelmed by all the rules that you're going to learn. But these rules are almost so intuitive. I bet you guys would probably do them even if I told you that they didn't exist. So first, let me introduce um, a couple of limit laws. So first off, Suppose that c is a constant. That means that c is just a number that we're multiplying or adding. And that the limits for these two functions, f of x and g of x, as they both approach the same x value, both exist. So they're not going to infinity or anything weird like that. They both go to a certain number. Then what that means is, one, if I'm taking the limit of those two functions added together, then I can take the limit of each of them individually and add them together. Same thing with subtraction. If I'm taking the limit of a function multiplied by a constant, I can just find the limit of that function and multiply the constant afterwards. Same thing as with addition and subtraction. If I'm multiplying two functions, okay, and then finding their limit, I can find the limit of each of their functions and multiply them. And same thing with division. The only thing you have to look at with for division, which is going to be kind of, um, again, a, another theme of the course is, bruh, don't divide by zero, okay? <clears throat> So let's look at this um, table down here at the bottom. So we want to look at the limit of the function f of x plus 5 times g of x as x approaches negative 2. So first off, f of x is the graph in the red here. So let's look at f of x and see what the value is as x approaches negative 2. Well, if I get really close to negative 2, it looks like my y value is approaching 1. Remember, that solid dot is what actually comes out of the function if you plug in negative 2, but a limit is if you're just getting close to negative 2. So for this one, I have that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this guy exists, and it equals 1, okay, plus, and now I need to find what 5g is. So per rule number 3, I can just leave that 5 outside and multiply it by whatever 5g is. So g of x, as x approaches negative 2, okay, so if I look at negative 2 and I look at my g graph, which is the one in blue, okay, it looks like as I get closer to that negative 2 on both sides, my function is getting closer to negative 1. So that means that the overall solution to this is going to be 1 plus 5 times negative 1, so I'll be 1 plus negative 5, so my solution will be negative 4. All right, let's look at the next one. So what's the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x times g of x? So again, we're going to look at the limit of f of x as we approach 1. So as we approach 1, looks like my y value is getting closer to 2 times, and now if I look at g, it looks like my g value Oh no, if I look at g as I approach 1, well, as I look at it from the left-hand side, it's approaching negative 2, right here. As I approach from the right-hand side, it's approaching negative 1. So that would be d and e. Well, what's 2 times d and e? That's just d and e. We can't do it. They have to both be defined. Sad face, right? All right, let's do the next one and the very last one. So, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x divided by g of x. So, if we look at f of x at 2, it looks like it's approaching 1 and a half. So we'll say 1.5. Divided by, and then g as we approach 2 is, oh no, it's approaching 0. So again, our limit is d and e because we broke one of those rules. You can do it as long as it doesn't equal 0. All right, but if it equals a the number, then you just push forward. All right, for the next one, instead of having a graph, we're going to look at doing it numerically. That means that they're going to give us numbers. So we have that the limit as x approaches 3 of our function f of x is negative 2, and the limit as x approaches 3 of g of x equals 9. So for the first one, we want to evaluate the limit of 7f of x as x approaches 3. So 
again, if we plug that in per rule number three of the above, I can just take that seven and pop it out and then multiply it by the limit of f of x as x approaches three. So that's gonna be seven times. Now remember, the limit of f of x as x approaches three is negative two, so I can substitute that in. And I get negative 14 for my answer. Awesome. Now, for b, it says what's the limit of f of x plus one as x approaches three? Now, by the very first rule of above, I can break this up, and that will be what's the limit of the function f of x as x approaches 3 plus the limit of 1 as x approaches 3. Now, we know the limit of f of x as x approaches 3, again, is negative 2, plus, well, what's the limit of 1 as x approaches 3? Well, if you look at the graph of just y equals 1, that's just a constant function. It equals 1 all the time, no matter what your x value is. So the limit of any constant is just itself. It equals 1. So we have negative 2 plus 1, so our limit is approaching negative 1. All right, for the next one, what is the limit of x times g of x as x approaches negative 3? So, by the fourth rule above, we can split this up into the limit of x as x approaches 3 times the limit of g of x as x approaches 3. Now, the limit of x as x approaches 3, if you look at this graphically or numerically, it's going to equal 3. I'll let you guys go ahead and do that. Times. And we know that the limit of g of x as x approaches 3 from the above is 9. So our solution will be 27. All right, I'm going to let you guys go ahead and do the next one. So go ahead and pause the video. Do those. You can fast forward and see if you did them correctly. All right, so the limit of f of x plus g of x. Again, we're just going to take each of those limits and add them together. So that would be negative 2 plus 9, so we should get 7. The limit of f of x times g of x as x approaches 3, that would be negative 2 times 9, because we can just multiply the limits together, so we're going to get negative 18. And last but not least, we are going to have f of x minus g of x. So remember, we can just subtract the limits of those two, and we're going to get negative 11. Beautiful. Now, a big limit law we have is that if you know that a function is continuous around a value a, okay, then you can just take that value as x approaches a and just plug it straight into your function. Okay? So, you can also apply the same thing if you're raising your function to a certain power as long as that power is a whole positive number. Okay? If you're um n value is not a whole positive number, if it's a fraction or a negative, what could possibly happen is that you might end up taking the square root of a negative number, which we're not allowed to do, we're keeping it real. The other thing that might happen is you might accidentally end up dividing by zero, which would be bad. Okay. All right. So, let's go ahead and take a look at these examples here. So for example, if we want to evaluate the limit using law above, we have the limit of x squared plus 4x as x approaches 1. So I know from my previous math classes that x squared plus 4x is a polynomial, which means it is continuous. That means I can draw it without picking up my pencil, and it doesn't have any holes or anything. So that limit is going to be 1 squared plus 4 times 1, which is going to give me 5. See how much easier that is than having to graph it or make a table? Oh, it's awesome. All right, the next one is we want to take the limit of sine of x as x approaches pi. Now, from trig, we know that sine of x is also a continuous function, so I can actually plug any number I want into it, and I'll get a number out. So that would be sine of pi, which equals 0. Now, for the next one, we're going to have x minus 1 divided by x plus 4 squared. 
Now, here's the thing. This function is continuous everywhere except for when x equals negative 4. That is kind of worrisome. But remember, our function just has to be continuous near that value. So 0 isn't close enough to negative 4 to really make us worried. So let's just go ahead and plug in 0 and hope that we don't break anything. So as long as we're not dividing by 0, we should be fine. So that would be 0 minus 1 divided by 0 plus 4 squared, which would give us negative 1 fourth squared, which would give us 1 16th. Awesome, we didn't break any math rules, so we're OK. So here are some steps on how to evaluate a limit algebraically. OK, so the first step is you should always just try to plug a into f of x. OK, after that, if you actually get a real number out, you're done. That's your answer. You, you, uh, you won math. Good for you. If you plug in f of a and you don't get a number, what you get is a number divided by 0, then what you get is that your limit is either going to be going to negative infinity, positive infinity, or it does not exist. Either way, what you can just write down is you can just write down does not exist. Now, the very special case that we are going to rack our brains over and learn so much about math is if you plug in a into your function and you get this very special 0 over 0. This is called an indeterminate form, and it is probably one of the most special things we're going to learn this term. If you get 0 over 0, your work is not done. What that means is that you are going to have to factor, rationalize, find a common denominator, expand, cancel, so many things. Okay? So if you get 0 over 0, what that means is that you get to do a little bit more work. So let's look at some examples. Okay, whoops. So let's evaluate this limit using the steps above. So remember, the very first thing that you are always, always, always going to do whenever you're trying to evaluate a limit is try plugging it in first. So if I plug 6 in, I'm going to have 6 squared minus 7 times 6 plus 6 divided by 6 minus 6, which is going to be 0 over 0. Okay? Ah! What does this mean? What this means is that we should try to change the way the function looks. So we should try factoring it, or rationalizing it, or finding a common denominator. So since I have two polynomials, a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to factor it. So I'm going to look at the limit as x approaches 6 of this top part is going to factor into x minus 6 times x minus 1 divided by x minus 6. Now, the cool thing that you guys might see right now, and you're just like, oh my gosh, is that x minus 6 cancels on the top and the bottom. So this limit is actually the same as finding the limit as x approaches 6 of x minus 1, which would give us 5. Now, before we move on to the other examples, I want to show you um, why that is true and why we can do that mathematically. So one of the key things I want to point out to you guys <clears throat> before we do that is that the functions x squared minus 7x plus 6 over x minus 6, that is not the same function as x minus 1. Okay? The big difference is that one has a hole in it and the other one doesn't. So even though they both look like straight lines, okay, what's actually happening is if we look at this guy, okay, and let's give these names. So I'm going to call this top one f of x. I'm going to call this bottom one g of x. Okay, they're going to look the same, but if I try to plug 6 into f of 6, what would happen is that I would try to scroll over it and I would end up having a hole. Oh yeah, 6 is over here. Okay, So I would try my hardest to scroll over it and it's like, no, I'm not going to do it because there's nothing there. Okay, 
But if I do it on this one, on the red one, and I type in 6 of g of 6, then I actually do have a point there. Now notice that even though one has a point and the other one would be hollow, the limit or the y value that they would be approaching would both be the same. It would both be 5. That's why it equals 5. All right, now on the next one, again, we're just going to try to plug in 2. So we're going to have 3 times 2 divided by 2 minus 2. That's going to give us 6 over 0. Now, if we look back up here, it says if you get a number over 0, then your limit is D and E. So we're okay. We don't have to do any extra work. That's just D and E. Okay. The reason it's D and E is because if you actually graph this guy, so 3x divided by x minus 2, okay, at 2 what you're going to have is you're going to have an asymptote. Okay, so as we approach from one side, it's going to go down to negative infinity. As we approach from the other side, it's going to go up to positive infinity. All right, let's look at this next one. The limit as h approaches 0 of 2 plus h cubed minus h, or minus 8 divided by h. So again, first thing you're going to do, try plugging it in. So 2 plus 0 is 2 to the third is 8, so we'll have 8 minus 8, so we'll have 0 over 0. Again, because we have 0 over 0 and not just a real number over 0, we have to do some more work. <clears throat> now, this is already factored pretty nice, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to expand it and see if anything neat happens when I expand it. And if you guys are wondering, how do you know whether you're going to expand, factor, etc.? If you already have something expanded, then you're probably going to have to factor it. Okay? If it's already factored, then you're probably going to have to expand it. So let's go ahead and expand this guy out. So that would be 8 plus 8 plus 12h plus 6h squared plus h cubed minus 8 all over h. Now, after I expand it, I'm going to go ahead and start simplifying it. So first off, on the very top, 8 is going to cancel with negative 8. The other thing I notice is that all of these have an h in common. So I'm going to go ahead and factor out an h. So I'm going to have the limit as h approaches 0 of h times 12 plus 6h plus h squared divided by h. Now, the cool thing that's happening right here is I have an h times something on the top and an h on the bottom, so you can now cancel those h's. So now what I have is the limit as 12 plus 6h plus h squared. I'm looking at this limit as h approaches 0. Now, after I'm done canceling all that good stuff out, there's not really a whole lot left I can do to factor this. So now that I'm done, I'm going to try to plug that 0 in again and see if I hit any brick walls. So if I plug 0 in again, I'm going to have 12 plus 6 times 0 plus 0 squared, which is going to give me 12. Now, if you do this and you're not sure if you did your arithmetic or your algebra correctly, you can always go back and um, just look at it numerically or graphically and see, mm, did I actually do it properly? So let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at this graphically and see if it actually equals 12. So we're going to go back to Desmos. Okay, and we're going to plug in 2 plus h, or 2 plus, we'll make it an x, minus 8. And remember, we want that whole thing divided by x. Okay, and we're looking as our h value, or our x value, approaches 0. So as we get closer to 0, it does look, see if I go over it, it says undefined. But as I get closer, it looks like I get 11.88 or 12.18. So it does look like it is approaching 12. So that's great. We did amazing. All right, now on D, we have the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 9 plus h minus 3 divided by h. Again, we are going to try plugging in 
zero. So we're gonna have the square root of nine plus zero minus three divided by zero. We're gonna give zero over zero. Now, if you see a square root like this, okay, what that's going to tell you you need to do is that you need to multiply by something called the conjugate. So here's what the conjugate is. If you take the limit as h approaches zero and you have the square root of nine plus h minus three divided by h, what the conjugate is going to be, it is going to be the top part but you're going to do something very special. You're going to change this sign to a plus. And you have to multiply the top and the bottom. Now, here is why that is such a nifty important thing to do. When you actually expand this top part out, don't ever drop the limit, keep it there you're gonna have the square root of nine plus h times nine plus h. So you're gonna end up having the square root of nine plus h squared, okay? Plus, so the square root of nine plus h times three. All right, then negative three times the square root of nine plus h. So I'm just foiling out the top part. Okay, and then minus negative three times three, maybe negative nine. All divided by, and we're just gonna leave the bottom alone. So here's why multiplying by the conjugate is such an important thing. Notice that this is a positive and this is a negative. And we have the same first and last term. So the first term is nine plus h all squared, <clears throat> or square rooted, and then the second term is three. Whenever we do that, we're always going to get opposite signs here and here, so those middle terms are always going to cancel out. So they go away. So what that does for us is we're going to end up with 9 plus h squared. Well, the square root and that square are going to cancel each other out. So we're going to get 9 plus h minus 9 all over h times the square root of nine plus h plus three. Now what's gonna happen is that these nines are gonna cancel out. We're gonna be left with an h divided by h times something, so the h's are also gonna cancel out. So this is actually going to simplify to the limit as h approaches zero of one divided by the square root of nine plus h plus three. Now if we plug zero into this guy, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get one over six. So these are probably one of the hardest ones we have to do, so I'm just gonna recap what we did. We plugged the limit in and we had zero over zero. Then what we did is we multiplied by the conjugate. The conjugate is when you take that sign that's on the outside of the square root and you change it. So if it's negative, you make it positive. If it was positive, then you'd make it negative. What that does for us is that after we FOIL this out, so multiply first, inner, outer, and last, okay? What that does is that's going to give us a positive term and an equally negative term in the middle, and those are always gonna cancel out. The reason that is so cool is because then we're left with the square root of nine plus h squared minus nine. Remember, the square root and square cancel each other out, and that is where we got the nine plus h, minus, and then we're left over with that nine, divided by, and we just left the bottom alone, we didn't distribute it because not only did we cancel out that nine and the negative nine, we were also able to cancel out the h on the top and the h on the bottom. All right, awesome, we just have two more examples. Okay, and then we're gonna go to the squeeze theorem, which will be a second video. So, the next example, <coughs> is we're gonna have the limit of one over x minus one third divided by x minus three. Now, again, if you just try to plug the limit in, you're gonna get zero over zero. So because we get zero over zero, we have to go another step further. I have to do something else. Well, it doesn't look like a polynomial, so I'm not going to try to factor it. Um, it also doesn't look like it's factored, so I'm not gonna to try to expand it. There's not a square root, so I'm not gonna to have to do this um, 
rationalizing business, but I am going to have to find a common denominator. Okay, so here's how we're going to do that. So when we're looking at this, we're going to have the limit as x approaches 3 of 1 over x. Go ahead and leave yourself some room on either side over 3 divided by x minus 3. Now whenever you're trying to find a common denominator, what you're going to do is you're going to multiply the left hand side by the denominator of the right hand side and vice versa. So we're going to multiply this by 3 over 3 and we're going to multiply this by x over x. Okay, The reason you can do that is because remember multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything and 3 over 3 is just like multiplying by 1. So we're just changing the way it looks. When we do this, we are going to get 3 divided by 3x minus x divided by 3x, all divided by x minus 3. Now that we have a common denominator, we can just push them together and subtract the tops. So this is going to become the limit as x approaches 3 of 3 minus x divided by 3x all divided by x minus 3. Now, I myself am not a big fan of triple decker fractions, so division is actually the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, aka the upside down. So first off, I'm going to rewrite this part as negative x minus 3. The reason you can do that is because if you distribute that negative, you'll get a negative x and a positive 3, so you'll actually get that same thing back. So divided by 3x. And dividing by x minus 3 is the same as multiplying by 1 over x minus 3. It's kind of like dividing by 4 is the same as multiplying something into 1 fourth. Now the whole reason we did that is because now, do you see anything cool that happens? Yeah, this x minus 3 and this x minus 3 cancel. So what I'm left with is the limit as x approaches 3 of negative 1 over 3x, which is going to give me, let's see, negative 1 ninth. Awesome, so those are the most basic forms. Um, what I want you guys to do is I want you to pause the video and try this next example on your own. After that, I'll show you how to do it, and then we're going to move on to the squeeze theorem, which I also like to call the nuclear option. All right, so now that we are back from pausing the video, let's go ahead and take a look at this next one. So first thing we're going to do, try plugging in the limit. When you plug in the limit, you're going to get 0 over 0, okay, because this would be the square root of 25, which is 5, and 5 minus 5 is 0. On the bottom, we'd have negative 4 plus 4, which would also give us 0. Now, <clears throat> if we are going to do this one, let's be smart. First off, it doesn't look like a polynomial because I have a square root in it. But because it has a square root in it, it makes me think that I'm probably going to multiply by the conjugate. So let's go ahead and try to multiply by the conjugate. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches negative 4, square root of x squared plus 9 minus 5, divided by x plus 4, now when we multiply by the conjugate, what the conjugate is, remember, is you're going to change the sign on the outside of the square root. So we're going to change that negative to a positive. Now when you FOIL that out, the nice thing about the conjugate is that it's always going to square that guy so you just get x squared plus 9 back, and it's also going to square this guy, so we're going to get minus 25, all divided by x plus 4 times, and we're just going to leave that bottom part the same. All right, let's simplify this out if we can. So that is going to be the limit 
as x approaches negative 4, I always just leave the bottom the same. I rarely expand out the bottom because usually keeping it this way is going to make cancellation easier. But let's go ahead and get the top. So this top part is going to be x squared plus 9 minus 25. That's going to become x squared minus 16. That's actually going to factor into x plus 4 times x minus 4. Now, since we did that, what's going to happen is that that x plus 4 and the x plus 4 on the bottom are going to cancel out. So this is going to become the limit as x approaches negative 4 of x minus 4 divided by the square root of x squared plus 9 plus 5. Now that looks pretty gross. Um, I also don't see how I could simplify it any further. I don't have anything that I can factor or do anything nice with, so I'm going to try to plug in that x minus 4 limit one more time. So if I plug in x as x approaches negative 4, on the top I'm going to get negative 4 minus 4, which will give me negative 8. On the bottom I'm going to get negative 4 squared, which is 16, plus 9 will give me 25. The square root of 25 is 5, plus 5 that will give me 10. So my limit is going to be negative 4 fifths. BA beautiful. That was a rough one, but I'm really glad that you guys paused the video, tried it out, struggled a little bit. That is how you learn. So I will see you in the next video, which we'll be talking about the squeeze theorem.